you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks, it's Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the big show. We certainly appreciate you guys, as always, for 16 years, 2,000 episodes. We bring you the most smartest minds, the most brilliant people, and none of them are me. Gosh darn it. I'm just some idiot who paid for the mic, made a show, and I don't know. I probably should be living on a Vidoc next to the river in a van. Somewhere I screwed the syntax of that up, but I'm not Chris Farley or as funny. Anyway, guys, welcome to the big show. Refer the show to your family, friends, and relatives, damn it, or else. What, what other kind of podcast the host threatens his audience with violence? Anyway, guys, go to goodreads.com for it says Chris Voss. What kind of show is this? YouTube.com for it says Chris Voss. LinkedIn.com for it says Chris Voss. So my guest is going, what the fuck did I get myself into? Um, that was exactly what I was going to yeah. say. Call my booking agent. What the fuck? Anyway, Chris Voss won the TikTokity, and if you really want to buy me a cup of coffee, because mine's about halfway empty right now, Go to buymeacoffee.com for chess Chris Voss. Please, I'm begging you. I live on coffee. Anyway, uh, we have an amazing young lady on the show. We're going to be talking about her hot new book that's flying off the presses here coming up in July. And, uh, you know, I wrote this the other day because you've heard me say on the Chris Voss show that stories are the owner's manual to life. And that's why we collect stories in the Chris Voss show, why I'm a griot, why we talk about people's stories, how they help you identify that you're not alone in the world and you can learn more. And I came with this saying that I'm going to say on the air for copyright purposes, but people are the sum of all their stories collected on their journey through life. Stories are the fabric of who we are. So if you reprint that, I'm going to see you. Anyway, so that's why we collect stories. And we've got an amazing storyteller to tell us her stories that she's collected through her life. Emily S. Block joins us on the show today. Her new book coming out July 16th, 2024 is called Business on the Edge, How to Turn a Profit and Improve Lives in the World's Toughest places. Emily's going to be talking to us about her insights there. She is an associate professor of strategy, entrepreneurship, and management, and the George Cormie chair in the management at a Alberta School of Business. We love Canada. Her research program explores how values, pluralism impacts the process of legitimacy and change, the nature of social evaluations, and how organizations organ- organizational theory can be used to understand and address grand challenges or just how to learn to speak properly. Her research has been published in journals such as AMJ, SMJ, JBV, JOM, MISQ, and JMS, and ABCDFG, HIJK, LMNOP, and all of it will help you get a JOB, maybe. Um, so she got her new book out. Welcome to the show, Emily. How are you? Thank you for having me. That was a great introduction, although I sound much more boring in my bio than I think I am in real life. <laughs> I mean, uh, we hope so, because we want you to be interesting for the audience. So give us your dot coms. Where can people find you on the interwebs? We are at the frontlinesinstitute.com. You can find me on Twitter and or X, I guess it is now, Dr. Emily Block and ES Block on Instagram and Emily Block on Facebook, or just send me an email at eblock at ualberta.ca because I'm in Canada. So there you go. You have I'm a lot of blocking going on. Have you seen a therapist? Oh about my that? gosh. <laughs> <laughs> So give us a 30,000 overview of your new book, Business on the Edge. Okay, so I spent the last 20 years or so doing service learning projects with my colleagues in all over the world, bringing students opportunities for them to work with NGOs and governments and big organizations and the military all over the world and trying to kind of humanize business a little bit, trying to figure yeah. out how business can solve non-business problems. Yeah. And I, we had collected all of these stories and all of these data, f you know, in all of our travels. We've been in 80, 80 projects, 30 different countries. Wow. And we really were looking for a way to bring them all together 
And mm -hmm. when I was pregnant with my daughter, I was on bed rest for a hundred days. So laying on my back, nothing to do, not even allowed to open my laptop. And my, my good friend and my co-author was like, okay, let's write a book. Let's write our book finally. <laughs> and so that's what we did. And I just laid there and talked on the phone with her and she typed and and we finally got a chance to kind of take a, you know, a huge high level view of all the work we had done and, and mm -hmm. try and bring it together in 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 a way that could maybe inspire some people and, and define some new opportunities. Wait, you mean I could have phoned in my book? I mean, maybe. Call I, my attorneys. I'm suing, <laughs> damn it. They gave me tight line. What the hell? Letter by you know, letter. I mean, I made her type. Oh, man, where do you get these people? Is she from? Um, oh, man. I'm working on my second book, and I have to type it. That's kind of the problem. Anyway. You should just use Otter AI or something just to talk it into your phone. That's <laughs> true. Some people are just letting AI type it themselves. Uh, <laughs> they're just giving it prompts and letting it write it. I mean, there's a lot of that going on in, on Amazon. But I, I, I do the... There's a cathartic thing that I have with writing. Ask anybody who knows me. They're like, you have a podcast and like to talk a lot, huh? And I'm like, how can you tell? And you're like, you write a lot just on about anything. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I, never, I never shut up. But I don't know. I should marry myself, I suppose. Yeah, on the cover, you have a picture of, of this. It's basically a grenade with a pineapple top coming out of the top of the grain. What is the symbolism behind that? So we actually took a picture, uh, that isn't the exact picture, but we took a picture of a piece of graffiti mm. in Colombia that that pictured this pineapple grenade and they kind of morph into one another. And it's really the symbolism of, of opportunity growing out of conflict. And that really stuck with us. And and we were really excited to be able to use that as a book. I, I wish we could, we knew who the street artist was who put it up there because we'd love to give it some credit. But you're in another country that doesn't have good copyright law, so it'll be fine. <laughs> But but then it essentially symbolized all the things that we were thinking about as as you know business as a tool for stability and also an opportunity to grow out of conflict and and that that really gave the message that we were that we we're looking for. There you go, really conflict. Now, why do you why did you focus on improving lives in the world's toughest places as a model for? Just about anybody who's in business that reads your book is it is it so that it sets a standard of you know if we can make this thing work and bombed out zimbabwe i'm not sure if zimbabwe is about bombed out don't sue me people don't write me but you know in, in, there are some war torn places and places that are definitely challenged it is is the premise that you know if we can make this work here in some of the toughest areas you can make it work on you know downtown san francisco or something of course downtown san francisco is kind of bombed out <laughs> that's i mean that's part of the point i mean we have we have some stories in our book about coming back into into more domestic markets and you know we are constantly in an uncertain environment if you look at COVID yeah. and how that changed businesses you know there were a lot of lessons that could be learned of our approach in new and uncertain environments that we may face anywhere but in particular we were really interested in kind of what we consider the front lines because you know everybody says if you ask any business and you say where are you internationally they'll say we're everywhere we're everywhere but they're not actually everywhere they're in every big city right they're in nairobi and they're in bogota and they're in you know maybe khartoum probably not right now but they say they're everywhere but they're really just kind of a couple miles from an international airport and if organizations are looking to expand really across the globe, you know, this constant desire for growth. There aren't that many places left in the world that are big cities that, that businesses aren't in, but there's huge markets everywhere else. So if you think about all the people who, all the people and all the opportunities that live in the non-capital regions mm -hmm. of lower and middle income countries, that's, you know, that's 1.4 billion people, that's the, the size of China, mm -hmm. and that's $20 trillion of economic activity. It's 30% wow. of the world's natural resources, and they're essentially out of, you know, untapped, right? <laughs> they're, they're, they're in places where you know, there there's conflict, sometimes drug trafficking, sometimes terrorism. Mm -hmm. They're disconnected from their home country's infrastructure. They don't have basic services often like electricity. You have to deal with 
I don't know, rule of law with local militias or cartels or political fra factions. You just can't go in, sit in your air-conditioned hotel, go in a fancy car to your air-conditioned conference room and talk to the Minister of Finance. That isn't yeah. what, what the front lines look like. And so if organizations are trying to grow into the, uh, they, these are the spaces that are left, mm -hmm. uh, we argue that, that you need a whole different set of tools and practices to be able to work in there. But then on top of that, we also believe that business can provide the infrastructure for stability in those places as well. So it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Hmm. Sounds like you're giving Starbucks more ideas on putting out more of their <laughs> schlepping more of their their places. There's I have a Starbucks in my third bedroom. Let's see, they're <laughs> everywhere. They think they are, but their coffee should be on the floor. Anyway, that's just that's not appropriate. Anyway, no, guys, well, what we want is we want Starbucks to be buying from local coffee growers oh, in yeah, the world, right? You, right? you know, yeah, those are the coffee makers I buy retailers that I support. The ones that support local. Uh, stuff in Africa and other places around the world, local farms, small farms, because that's usually where you get your good coffee. This is like becoming a coffee show, isn't it? Um, <laughs> the uh, before we get into you and your upbringing, I do have to make one point. Your your what? How do you pronounce your co-author's name? Viva Barkas. Viva Ona Barkas. Yes. Is that all right? Yeah. I, do you do you constantly whenever you walk she walks in the room go Viva Ona Barkas? My know. husband does that all the time. Does he? Actually, Good for him. <laughs> he's a really smart guy. I can tell the because I would do that because I'm annoying. He's always like, "How's Viva Las Vegas doing?" Viva <laughs> Ona Barkas. I would just sing it. I get really good. Anyway, I put a lot of work into setting up and doing that joke, didn't I? Like, it's half the show at this point. So anyway, <laughs> people like to get to know the author. Tell us a little bit about yourself. How, what were some of your upbringing? What got you down this road of doing all this? Let's go to Haiti and see what the hell we can get blown up on ourselves or something. I don't know. You know, I'm one of seven kids in my family. and That explained it. You're trying to get away, huh? Yeah, running away really, really far. No, I... You know, my, all of my siblings did all of this, like, humanitarian stuff, right? You know, worked in orphanages and, like, homeless shelters and did teaching English in Belize and one wanted to be a monk and, you know, and I, I went to business school, worked for a consulting company, and my parents, you could see their faces every time they were, like, telling stories. It's like, Doug's going to be a monk, but... Emily, we're hoping she'll go to grad school. Like I was the black sheep of our family, kind of wow. wanting to go the traditional, you know, don't get a job, Emily, don't. But, you know, I think that a part of it was a little bit, I don't know, rubbing off on me. And, but I, I kind of thought like, why do I have to be a blood sucking, horrible human who doesn't care about the world just because I'm in business? I could actually care about the world and, you're really insulting me at skills. this point. <laughs> you realize that, right? I apologize. I, I'm a blood sucking, whatever. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> no, it's just, you know, thinking about, I just feel like business has gotten such a bad reputation. Oh. I mean, and granted, some of it is warranted, but it is a set of tools and practices and skills that can be really used to make the world a better place. And mm -hmm. a very small minority of businesses and a very small minority of, you know, business people are kind of driving the narrative. And mm -hmm. I see the failure of the aid model, like trillions of dollars pumped into economies with very little result. And I, I really think there's a heck of a lot of human dignity in a good day's work. I think people mm -hmm. like to take care of their families and I think they want to, you know, have stability in their lives. And, and economic stability does that. And economic viability does that. And, you know, I believe fundamentally that business can be a tool for good. And it's just about figuring out how to flex those muscles, figuring out how to use them. Why is it important for business to use, you know, for me being a blood sucking, whatever it was you referenced earlier, why, why is it important to not be that? And, and do you try and do better with your tools and, and, and do better to help people feel better? Like, why can't I just be like a billionaire and just not give a shit, I guess. I mean, I mean, I would argue that the skills that you, you, if you can work, this is where going back to your, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. I think that if all you want to be is a blood sucking billionaire, you could use those skills to 
gain gain prominence. You can but where's the fun in that? Emily, I mean, for me, where's the I, fun in that? I just want a little bit more excitement in my life. But but I really do think that that that's what you buy the second yacht for. <laughs> <laughs> take the second yacht yeah, that's and stay the off fun. the coast of Senegal. Yeah. No, you enslave a few people in, in a third world country and, you know, get them working wines and stuff and you buy the yacht. But I also think that, that we're all in this together, like in the uh, world, right? And not really. The billionaires are all in together. I've been hanging out with Elon Musk too much. Go on. <laughs> I don't know. Climate crisis, COVID, supply chain challenges, poverty. That's what like the bunkers war. are for. That's what the million dollar bunkers are for. That mean. Uh, uh, I'm hoping to put the bunker people out of business. That's what I'm looking oh, for. <laughs> Facebook needs, needs that. So let's do it. So it's important. It makes the world everyone feel better you contribute to the world and then you're not a blood sucking leech and you can make money i mean i think that that there's money to be made in these markets and mm -hmm. there and they have the additional benefit of improving people's lives there you go improving people's lives what a concept note to self be less blood sucking maybe <laughs> cut it down by i don't know 10%. <laughs> so there you go. So tell us some of the stories or examples maybe you've used in the book that you're, you know, you've set forth as blueprints that companies can use. So I'll give you a story that's a little disconnected from a company in particular, but I'll talk a little bit about how I think that business as an approach can contribute in places where it, it wouldn't normally be used. And the, my, my favorite and kind of Kind of heartbreaking, but also very illustrative example of this is the business of sex trafficking. Hmm. So we were working in the Philippines with a partner who was looking to improve their programming as an NGO, trying to improve their programming in, in human trafficking. And, you know, all the work they were doing was in like trying to prevent people from being recruited in the first place, like with, you know, public service announcements, hmm. or once they get rescued, trying to kind of give them skills and job training and psychological training to help mm. them help them reintegrate back into society. But when we kind of joined with this partner, we, we said, what happens between recruitment and rescue? And is there anything we can be done in this space to actually change the equation? Yeah. Uh, so what we did is we just pulled out our supply chain analysis. And, you know, sadly, people in this case are products and mm -hmm. they have to be moved. And most of the time you use supply chains to figure out how to get things better from A to B. But mm -hmm. in that case, we were able to figure out how by tracing the path of a trafficked person from their village to a brothel and how can we make it more expensive for traffickers, more difficult for them? Hmm. You know, what are some of the tension points there? Oh, and, so make and it so, harder for them to move and traffic people that and more expensive or, uh, oh. you know and it, it might be easier for them to do it online it might be easier for them to traffic in drugs or in animals maybe mm. you know and but we want to shift their business model we want to at least make it more expensive mm. because the returns right now on a trafficked person it's all profit for for the bad guys wow. and if we can erode some of that profit maybe we can get them into into some other activities i saw this uh, i don't know i saw this like thing on on instagram it was talking about how the local italian restaurant in a town used to be a front for the mob but they now they make such great pizza that they've shifted their business model entirely you know that's mm. kind of the goal yeah. is that if if you can you know really create legitimate business opportunities for people that's where that's where most people want to go there you go and if you add some pineapple to that pizza you can make even more profit Oh, that's so Canadian. I just lost the I just lost the Italian crown. But there's five of them, so it'll be fine. Anyway, so these are great ways that people can use this to turn a profit and improve lives in tough places. If you can make it there, you can make it anywhere, I guess is the thinking, right? And that by working in these environments, you can actually create the scaffolding for peace building. So we work with a partner in Colombia that does a lot of reintegration between ex-FARC com combatants and the villagers that live in the areas that they had totally damaged for 50 years of civil war. And then there's this peace agreement, the FARC soldiers resettle into these environments and they're side by side with communities that have been terrorized by war. And, and how do you stop that conflict from just 
continually persisting. One way to do it is to encourage these like values neutral interactions, transactions between people that get them to know one another. And eventually they start building these relationships and actually build building business together or uh -huh building, selling with one another, realizing that their lives are interconnected, kind of breaking down those stereotypes and actually contributing to the to the restabilization of that environment. Hmm. There you go. So it sounds like some of this can, you know, one of the things we were able to establish in the world through the Marshall Plan and, and other things was, you know, an integrated world economy that, you know, made it so that money was more important than war and maybe we'd all just get along until yeah. the Russians came along. But with the Ukraine, you know, that, that was kind of the idea that we, you know, we get along better if we, if we trade, if we're trading partners and, you know, we scratch each other's back a little bit when we're not spying on each other. <laughs> but it's a weird coke and dagger game. But, you know, that, so we can do that. And, and I imagine a lot of war-torn places, that's really important. I mean, you look at, you look at Africa and just what a... I mean, it's a beautiful continent. It has a lot of resources, you know, between AIDS and, and revolutions and wars and stuff. You know, it, it's, it's just a constant. It just seems like it's a constant shit show. And, man, if you, could, if you could ever get that whole continent to work together with each other to do business and get along, it would probably be one of the most powerful countries in the world. Yeah, it would, it would be a, there. Were, there would be lots of really powerful places, and and mm. honestly, if you take a look at the growth rates in what was in the two thousands and the nineties, mm. kind of what Paul Collier would call like the bottom billion, those countries in mostly sub-Saharan Africa that were that were experiencing no or declining GDP growth per capita, and now they're growing faster than anywhere else, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, look at the growth rate in Rwanda over the last yeah. 10 years. It's pretty It's pretty astounding. But in most places where we see that, that growth rate, we're seeing it in the cities, not mm. really across the country. And for me, that's an opportunity for organizations, that for businesses that, that want, there's a, there are places on this earth that are not, they, that are not expanded into, that have underutilized capital, underutilized labor, underutilized resources that can be the source of real wealth generation, both for or companies and for those populations. Definitely. I mean, the biggest problem with Africa was, I think it was AIDS wiped out a quarter, if not a third of its, not only youth, but its older generation. It, 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 it put it back like 20, 25 years. And totally yeah. reshaped kinship networks and how people care for, yeah. you know, middle generation was just uh, gone yeah it would be interesting to see like i say if they ever got that whole con continent together to to become a powerful thing because i mean I think, I think there's more resources there than there is anywhere else on earth i don't know yeah. it is the cradle of civilization so there you go anything more we should tease out to get people to pick up the book before we go i i I would say that there's a huge value in bringing these skills back home as well. So we have a friend who did the Johnson & Johnson rollout for their COVID vaccine, the J&J &J rollout. And, you know, J&J &J didn't get, get as much good press about their vaccine rollout as, as, the, as Pfizer, but J&J &J did some really astounding things when they made some decisions around their vaccine rollout. They purposely chose single dose, non-refrigerated, focused on vaccine hesitant people. And mm -hmm. they their partnerships that they developed to be able to deploy this vaccine with SEC coaches and with, you know, with Southern Baptist churches in order to kind of reach rural vaccine hesitant people Mm -hmm. That that was amazing, and in fact, the the person who was in charge of that was one of our students and former students at, at Notre Dame in this program. And, and he kind of called Viva up and he said, "If I'm going to take this job, how do we run the bot full play business on the front lines play, which is what we call our call our program?" And it's like, "How do we run this play?" And it really is the same thing. It's building unusual partnerships, getting your boots dirty, really getting to know the environment, reaching out into rural places that aren't normally prescribed and covered, and really looking for opportunities to 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 use business tools creatively. And so. If you're doing this around the world, that's great. It also gives you, there's some real skills that you can bring back when we have those uncertain times here. 
There you go. So this has been fun to have you on, Emily, and talk about all these wonderful things. And, of course, find out about your co-author and uh, pineapples that have grenades attached to them, which I'm never going to cut open. So there you go. Give us your dot coms, Emily, so we can find you on the interwebs. So frontlinesinstitute.com and find me on LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook or Insta. Um, there you go. Yeah, eblock. There you go. And thank you, Emily, for coming on. Thanks for honest for tuning in. Go to goodreads.com, for Chess Chris Voss, all the crazy places on the interwebs. Be good to each other. Stay safe. Order the book where refined books are sold, July 16th, 2024. Business on the Edge, How to Turn a Profit, Improve Lives in the World's Toughest Places. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. We'll see you next time. Or not. <laughs>